name is Matthew Gaston. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. This is a photo of me when I was younger. Um, I went to the San Antonio Botanical Garden as a kid and got super into plants. I'd like volunteer and water their ferns and went to summer camp and that really got what me hooked on plants. Um, and then I ended up going out to California to study plant biology and genetics and education. Uh, I minored in education because I was afraid of talking in front of people. So I said, I'll force myself to talk in front of kids because they'll be the worst. Um, and then I realized it was really fascinating and working with people and helping them understand the world around them was really thrilling. Uh, and then I was like, I want to become a professor. And so I was like, I'm going to go do my PhD in Hawaii. Um, turns out to, I just wanted to teach. I didn't want to do research. So I was like, I'm going to leave and go back to Texas and focus on education. So I just got my master's in tropical plants and came back to Austin. So that's where we are now, obviously. Um, today, you know, a lot of my excitement on microgreens was just out of curiosity of things. So uh, as a kid, I was always interested in big, le big leaves. Microgreens are like the opposite. They're tiny leaves. So I have some photos of me growing up collecting larger leaves. This is a teak leaf. Most of the forests of Malaysia are made of teak wood, which is fascinating. And then, you know, palms have some of the larger leaves. Um, they're useful for protecting yourself in weather. But, so in March 2020, uh, the pandemic hit, and there was a lot of, you know, being stuck inside. So, okay, what can I do inside of my apartment, inside of my house, with a small amount of space um, that's plant-related? Well, I could grow house plants, but I could also grow maybe some other plants, like microgreens. So I spent a lot of time indoors playing video games, like Animal Crossing, and then growing little daikon radishes. So one of my projects I had was growing um, these. And so I had tons of seeds with me. I said, I might as well just grow them and eat them, cook them in omelets and things. And then that kind of began some of my interest in uh, microgreens because I was stuck inside with you know, a desire to do something with plants. I had a little apartment in like downtown Honolulu. Um, so today we'll have four main kind of discussion points. Uh, the first are what are microgreens? So what are they? What about them is interesting? Uh, we're gonna talk about germination, which is kind of a, a key component of microgreens. That's half of what's going on is just germination. Then we'll be talking about different ways to grow them and the growing systems. And then lastly, um, getting started growing your own. Where do you start? What materials can you get? So, you know, you should always begin kind of at the big picture. So I always begin with space. Uh, you know, we're on Earth here, and a lot of folks are interested in going to the moon and Mars. And so if people go out to the moon and Mars, uh, what should we be worried about? Uh, it is extremely dangerous. Uh, there's no oxygen. There's cosmic radiation that induces a lot of it, a stress, physiological stress on us. It uh, would cause severe degradation of our, you know, bodies weather rapidly. So uh, how do we maintain our healthy, you know, composition in such a horrible, uh, unsafe environment? This is something NASA is interested in. So how can we keep people healthy in space when it's really just a fight against the environment? So the question is, how do you preserve your health in such an unhealthy place? Well, maybe you have vitamin and antioxidant supplements. Maybe that's something we can do. So if you look at the current literature on vitamin supplements, there's a couple things that you notice. Um, one is that there's no evidence suggesting that there's dietary benefits to taking antioxidant um, uh, supplements. Uh, there is only one example, which is related to lutein and zeaxanthin, protecting your eye and reducing you know, degeneration. But everything else, there's no good data suggesting that taking a, the vitamin will help. Uh, but there is plenty of observational studies saying, hey, just eat fruits and veggies, and that's good for your, your health. But it's probably because of a combination of things. So the National you know, Institute of Health has concluded that just eating fruits and veggies is the way to go. Trying to capture, encapsulate something like soy lint and eating that every day isn't going to keep you from you know, perishing. Uh, so. Uh, we know that we want to eat fruits and veggies. Excellent. Easy. Uh, we will need to efficiently produce nutrient-rich foods in small spaces. Maybe you're in an apartment, maybe in a spaceship, maybe in a Martian colony. Uh, so for me, it was apartments. You need to have high nutrient density. So you've got to have a lot of nutrients in a small space. It has to be compact and small at the time of harvest. You don't want to be growing a giant tomato plant just to get 10 little tomatoes. 
and those aren't even you know super super nutrient rich. Uh, and then you want it to grow quickly so you can have a quick turnaround of, of food. So what does this give us? Oh no, uh, act one, what are microgreens? So this is kind of one of the solutions to that question, how do you maintain your health when you have a harsh environment and you only have a small space? Uh, well, microgreens, what are microgreens? Well, they're nutrient dense, so we know that they have more nutrients in them per unit volume compared to the full mature plant. Uh, so eating, so I have two here. This is a radish, there's daikon radish, and the purple one is called red rambo radish. It's a cultivated variety of radish. Um, and then there's broccoli. Well, this little tiny daikon per unit volume has more nutrients in it than the actual giant daikon root volume. Um, and by nutrients, I mean, you know, different um, antioxidant type of things as well. Uh, so there's lots of data showing that to be true, with a few exceptions. Broccoli is one of the exceptions. Uh, it's compact and small, so easy. Uh, then it grows quickly. This is only four days old. So I put, I had broccoli seeds the other day with a school group, the kindergarten, and they started watering all the seeds. By the end of the day, the seeds were already growing. The, the seed coats had broken off those cotyledons that expanded, and, and yeah. So the last thing is that they're pretty popular with folks, especially, in, you can come take a seat. We're talking about microgreens. Um, <laughs> so the microgreens kind of started in San Francisco as a kind of a, one of those bougie food things, you know, you put on top of your soup. Uh, but then people realized they kind of liked it because it added a little hint of flavor and the intensity of the flavor is really high compared to maybe, you know, growing a little microgreen cilantro versus full cilantro, microgreen cilantro is a real kick. Uh, so microgreens are any herbaceous plant grown in light and harvested as the first true leaves emerge. Uh, so we have some examples here of some of my favorites. Daikon, which is the Japanese radish, it has a kind of wasabi flavor, so the glucosinolate sulfury spiciness to it. Uh, you have bull's blood beet, tastes like beets. If you like beets, great. I don't like them. Uh, then you have arugula. So the arugula, just as your regular arugula, tastes the same but more intense. And then cilantro. So you'll notice that these photos are photos of when you'd want to harvest them. So we'll talk about the kind of morphology and what different sections of this little plant are, but you'll notice between some of these that they have distinct differences related to their first true leaves. So this little thing coming up is the leaf, and then I'll click through and you'll see it circles all of them. Uh, that's the first true leaf of the beet, that's the first true leaf of the arugula, and the first true leaf of cilantro. With cilantro, to get your most bang for your bunk, buck, and then based on kind of uh, trials of tests of when it tastes the best. You want it to get its first true leaf to become large. But if you did that with daikon, it would be completely unpalatable because only the little heart-shaped leaves called cotyledons have tons of flavor. And then once it starts growing out its first true leaf, which is fuzzy and coarse, it changes its biochemical properties and it tastes bitter and horrible. Um, so uh, that's something we'll discuss here in a second. But microgreens, you can make a lot of money too. So Let's say you got all these racks in your apartment, you got some lights, you could grow tons of microgreens and sell them for a lot uh, if you partner with a local market or something. Or just go to a farmer's market and bring this uh, you know, to the market and say, hey, cut your own and then put them in the box and we'll you know, charge you per weight. That way you get away, you don't have to worry about washing it and you don't have to get special licenses for health code stuff. So if, if the customer cuts it themselves, then that's on them to make sure they don't get sick. Um, so that, but with this, this is an example this is in Hawaii, so everything's more expensive to begin with, but these are green pea microgreens, and it's $11 just for this small container. And then that's two ounces. And then also you can use them for things like sushi. So daikon is a Japanese radish that has that kind of wasabi um, horseradish flavor. Well, you can put them into your sushi rolls and they taste perfect. So there's a lot of uses for them throughout uh, you know, different food industries and uh, they add that kind of herb flavor if you want them. Also, you could just completely make a whole salad of microgreens. So these are kind of different radishes with actual radishes. Um, you can top off your soups with them, and then you could add them on top of maybe avocado toast or something. There's lots of ways you can use them, uh, and their popularity seems to be increasing. So those were my initial little container of daikon radishes that I grew, but 
let's talk about the parts of it so that we have some terminology going forward. Um, this on the right is one of these uh, microgreens that I removed. So the little section where the root meets this stem is called the crown. So that junction between root and shoot is called the crown. The uh, next thing is we're talking about the cotyledons. That's where all the flavor is and the majority of the, the thing that you want to be selecting for with your microgreens are the cotyledons. Um, cotyledon, those are the first like baby leaves. So they're, on a lot of the crops, they might be heart-shaped. So the radishes here have heart-shaped cotyledons. The broccoli is heart-shaped. Um, and then sometimes they're just blade-like. But those aren't true leaves because they don't have a, a meristem at the base. So botanically, they're not true leaves. And the thing that comes up next will be the first true leaf. The shoot apical meristem is the main growing point of the shoot, and that's where the leaves come from. So if you cut it anywhere below the shoot apical meristem, it's never going to grow again. So all of these little, you'll see later, but all of these little uh, stems here where I have snipped or the student has snipped on that little stem, it will never grow back. So that is uh, something worth noting. It's one and done. One seed gives you one microgreen. So the sustainability component is that it, you have to get a lot of seeds. Um, not super sustainable in that sense. Uh, the stem section is technically it's called the hypocotyl. So hypo is below and caudal referring to cotyledons. So this stem below the cotyledons is the hypocotyl. So to say it you know, botanically, if you cut along the hypocotyl, you will not get any regrowth. But that's what a microgreen is. So you always cut uh, somewhere between the crown and the, and the apical meristem, probably pretty low on the cotyledon. So if you're harvesting these, I would probably cut right there on the hypocotyl. And then you have the roots. So what plants can be microgreens? What can you select? Uh, well, you can pretty much select any plant to be a microgreen, especially uh, oh, anything really, except for solanaceous crops. So anything in the nightshade family, you can't select for because they're toxic uh, when they're small. But you could use the ones we've already talked about, daikon and the, the other radishes and beets. And we have some photos here. But my particular favorite is that uh, raffinous red rambo or the red rambo radish, which I have here. It's spicy, but it's not too spicy. And it has a lot of antioxidants in the sense of uh, anthocyanin, which is one of those plant pigments. So there's uh, four types of plant pigments. There's like chlorophylls, which are green. And then uh, one of those classes of red and, and uh, purple are anthocyanins, which uh, people believe to provide antioxidant properties and help with uh, the, you know, radicals de degrading your cells. So what plants cannot be microgreens? Well, we kind of talked about uh, you can't choose solanaceous crops. So nothing in the nightshade family that would include your tomatoes, eggplants, uh, bell peppers. You can't really eat those. So solanaceous crops are nightshade family, no potatoes. Most people are not growing potatoes from seed like that, but you know, not an issue. But this is what you might have a small potato or small um, tomato. They look almost identical uh, in that stage. But uh, yeah, so what plants can be microgreens? You've got herbs, you've got vegetables, and you've got flowers. These are kind of based on their fl uh, flavor profile. So I'll show some popular ones here. Uh, we have, whoop, let's push that. Uh, there's dill, which makes an excellent microgreen, basil, uh, you have uh, sorrel, and anise hyssop, which is kind of your uh, licorice-y flavor. This is a little bit different. Then you have vegetables, uh, like broccoli, uh, mizuna, scallion, and then your alfalfa. And then flowers, these have a floral flavor, and they kind of taste how they smell, which is interesting and a good thing to you know, change up your, your, your plate of food. So you can have celosia, then there's marigolds, uh, borage, and then amaranth. So amaranth and celosia have those really bright colors that are exciting if you're trying to create, create a really uh, you know, interesting uh, color palette on your plate um, because they have betalain. So the same chemicals that beets, the, the, the intense color of beets are in those. So they're edible at all life stages. Well, some of them are. And a good example is broccoli. So you could eat it broccoli at any life stage. A little tiny sprout, a little leafy green, or even the whole flower head, which is what we think of broccoli usually as. Uh, but so some plants are completely edible at any stage. So you could grow broccoli in darkness for like one day. And you get a sprout. 
and then you could grow it for 7 to 10, 14 days, and you get a microgreen. This is more uh, nutrient-rich than a sprout because when you, in, you apply some light into that system, then the plants are, okay, we better start creating things to protect ourselves because we're outside in the light, and uh, we need to start photosynthesizing and creating uh, defense chemicals, which to us end up being beneficial nutrients. Um, and then, additionally, you could grow it out further. And there's markets for either of you know, some of these different products. So just to differentiate, I always get this question, so I have a slide on it. Microgreens are typically plants you grow from 7 to 20 days in the sun, and you grow them or, or in the light, and then you grow them with nutrients. Sprouts, on the other hand, are much shorter. They're usually just grown in water with no nutrients, and you don't give them light. So they don't develop the chlorophyll. So you'll see that they don't have the, the little leaf is small, underdeveloped. This is a plant physiological response in that if they don't get any red light, which is part of our normal white light, then they just say, oh, let's make a really thick hypocotyl and keep growing and growing and growing until we hit the soil surface or the light. So this is a whole field of, of like study of how plants um, reach the light and change their uh, biochemistry and physiology. But it's good to identify that because people always mix them up and they're pretty distinctly different, uh, especially when you look at their, their health benefits. So plants don't grow at the same rate, uh, which is something we all know. But it's good to identify that. And something that we can show here is that microgreens can be harvested at different times. So I have this huge graph that we will click through quickly for the sake of time. Um, and so daikon is my favorite kind of example of a microgreen because it's huge, it grows quickly, has a very distinct flavor. Uh, and we have the plant name on this side and then days on the top. So this little bar indicates when you would harvest your microgreen. So daikon, you can harvest it between 7 and about 15, 16 days. If you let it go further, it'll develop those first true leaves and get really uh, bitter. The flavor will completely change. So those are pretty quick. And then beet takes about twice as long. It's just a smaller, slower growing plant. Um, the amount of weight you get is much less, but you still get that distinct beet flavor. Arugula, a lot like daikon. Cilantro and dill, these more specialty herbs, take twice as long. So you have to get, for those, you have to get their first true leaf to start emerging to get some real substance there, but the flavor is incredible. And as we go through, uh, this is one exception. The anise hyssop does take a super long time just because it, it's so small you need it to get a little bit more full. But we'll populate all of these and we'll see that we can kind of break this into two distinct categories of, of microgreen. Um, we have borage, celosia, mizuna, broccoli, sorrel, basil, all being pretty quick. And, oh, click through it again. <laughs> Fast growing and slow growing types. So all of the ones that grow really quickly, you could probably grow them all in one tray together and then harvest them all together because they'll all be ready at the same time. Uh, there are some mixes you can do to create a diverse palette of, of, of microgreens where they're already mixed in, and if you go to a farmer's market or if you do it yourself, you can show it, and they can just cut and take. Uh, some of them you'd probably grow separately, like cilantro. You don't want to mix cilantro with a marigold. It would be weird if you eat them together. It'd be weird flavor. But those would be considered kind of slow-growing, these ones that take about two weeks versus one week. So... The key to um, everything, really, especially in plants and everything in life, really, is diversity. So with your microgreens, you also want diversity. So you want to have, if you're going to eat a microgreen salad, you want to have a diverse mix of different species um, or cultivars. So this one here is something that they sell with all the seeds mixed together. They grow at the same rate. They have different colors and different flavors. This is a Mizuna cabbage, kale, and kohlrabi mix. These are all in the same family kind of the mustard family. So they have similar favor flavor profiles too, uh, but they are different and add some diversity to that. So you want complementary harvest dates, complementary flavors, and complementary appearance. You probably don't want, well, I mean, I don't know. I would like a tie-dye of different microgreens, but they would taste bad together. So considering the different factors there, it's important. Uh, these two are interesting because these are all different cultivated varieties of radish. So different colors and slightly different flavors, but they still have that same radishy flavor, which is you know, desirable for some people. And then these are beets and chard. So beets and chard are the same plant. It's just one you select for a big root, one you select for big leaves. Um, so when you think about it, every microgreen has its own stats. So every microgreen is going to have different characteristics, maybe like a Pokemon would. 
So this is one of my favorite little Pokemon. It's based on the pitcher plant, um, the Victory Bell. You can see the Victory Bell has really good attack, but it's not super good in defense. So okay, you have to balance it out with other different Pokemon on your team if you're playing Pokemon. Same thing with microgreens. So broccoli, um, this is our broccoli. It's got really high, you know, pretty good growth rate. It grows in about seven days. It has a lot of phenolics in it, uh, a lot of chlorophyll, but it's not super high in anthocyanin, which is this purple pigment that gives them that color. Um, carotenoids give, you know, the yellows and the orange colors of carrots. That's not super high either. So when you're trying to get a nice balance of different um, things that are considered beneficial um, health uh, vitamins and, and uh, antioxidants, you want to have diversity. So there's lots of research on this. Um, this graph here basically identifies different uh, cultivated varieties of microgreen. The names don't really matter, but the important thing is to identify that we're looking at phenolic content, which is something deemed as a healthy thing to consume uh, on this graph. And this is anthocyanin, which is also deemed to be a healthy thing as an antioxidant. Um, you see here that this one, BN, has a ton of anthocyanins uh, compared to the others. The letters on top mean that they're different, they're statistically significantly different contents. So A means, OK, this whole thing is hugely and statistically significantly different than the other ones. Um, these two are both E, so those are basically the same to account for different experimental errors. Uh, and then here, all of them that say C, those are basically equivalent. But this one, uh, BN, over there, BN also has a really high amount of those phenolics. Now, I just selected the graphs that would I, you know, you know, idealize BN, this broccoli cultivar. But there's different other benefits to the other ones. So this is always a fun thing to show. Uh, that shows the different cultivars we just looked at. So there's these six different types. Uh, BN is our red square. Uh, and each of these represent a different one. But let's look at BN. So it's up here. So each of these little axes represent a different uh, nutrient profile deemed to be beneficial for consumption. Uh, so we have anti-radical activity, anthocyanins, chlorophyll, calcium, potassium, fiber, proteins, carotenoids, and tocopherols, which is kind of like a vitamin A thing, I think. But um, these, this is your BN, really high in anthocyanin, but super low in fiber. So maybe we add this CR, the green square, uh, there to help complement that. So just as you're making a plate of food, also with your microgreens, you want to have a diversity so you get the full profile. Um, and usually, different colors helps indicate that. So if you have a, they always say, oh, make your plate colorful. Well, yes, there's, a, there's actually some science to that. So different nutrient profiles for different microgreens, just like your Pokemon might have different stats. You want to have a different Pokemon uh, on your team to balance it up. So uh, where do you get the seeds and, and what can you buy? There's lots of places to buy seeds. My favorite is Johnny Seeds. They're a cooperative uh, out of the Northeast. Uh, they have really high quality seeds and they are very reliable. Now this particular screenshot, they didn't have these uh, in stock, but you can see that they have the, the mild microgreen mix. So a lot of those plants in the mustard family have an intense flavor that's kind of like wasabi type. Well, they say, well, these have that, but it's not super in, uh, intense. And you can buy them by, you know, five pounds, all that. So the next thing to notice is germination. So germination is critical uh, for microgreens because that's all it is. You get the seed and you germinate it and then you eat it. So uh, you get the little seed, you get seed germination. It grows and so we begin vegetative growth. So producing vegetative tissue to make nutrients so it can keep growing with an ultimate goal of reproduction. Uh, you'll get more vegetative growth. Now you get the flower production. And then from flowers, you get fruit and seed development, and you've completed the cycle. So this is the life cycle of daikon radish, my favorite little microgreen. Um, this is the fruit called the salik, and it splits open. You get the seed, and you just restart. Um, but microgreens really only care about this. So you can buy the seed and grow it and eat it. Uh, the seed is an embryonic plant with a protective cover, waiting for the right conditions to grow. When the seed is ready, it begins germination. 
which is the reactivation of metabolism and growth. So the first step of germination is called imbibition. So the little seed absorbs water and it gets bigger. This is a physical property. It has nothing to do with the thing being alive or dead. It's just, uh, you know, you got proteins, fats, and uh, carbohydrates in the seed. And water is going to make it swell. That's just, uh, so you could have your seed imbibing and it could be dead. Uh, that's the first step. Once it's alive and it's soaked up the water, then that little embryo in there can start reactivating its uh, metabolism. So this is called the repair and mobilize phase. So the little embryo is like, okay, we got water, uh, we're, we got the right conditions, let's start fixing our DNA, which has been damaged because we've been a little seed, and let's start moving around different proteins in our, in our cells to be able to grow. And then you have expansion and growth, which is the part that we always think is the germination. But it's really the end of germination. And some people don't include this as germination in like scientific literature. But that's when you get the little root coming out called a radical or radical. I call it radical. Um, radical emergence would be a good title of a book. Um, anyway, so seed germination is described by water. It's all about how much water the seed has. And you can classify stages of seed germination based on the water content. Over time, so time's going this way and water's going that way. So we talked about those three parts of seed germination. Uh, well, let's look at the water content. And the first step is imbibition. So your water increases and hits a limit and it pretty much stays at that water content for a while. Um, that's your imbibition stage. That's what your seed is restarting metabolism and then degrading some stored micro RNA or messenger RNAs. Um, the seed will look like that. Excellent. Not super thrilling looking, but still alive, usually, if it makes it to this stage. So then phase two, the water content is hardly increasing. This is when it's repairing itself and preparing uh, to fully emerge. And then for some people, they'll cut germination off here, but I like this nice flow. So we include phase three, which is the expansion and growth. So that's the last part. You get the cell division, the roots are going off. It's having a good time. So now we're going to talk about how you grow them, best ways to grow them. What do you need? Well, growing systems. I grew them in a pot in a window. You can totally do that. You could get this tray and put it over the window, and it would do great. Just rotate it every day and so they don't lean too much. Um, I had a wine rack I got from an old Greek restaurant, and I grew my plants on there with a grow light. So it doesn't need to be fancy. You could do it in a greenhouse. You could do it in your window. Um, but I'll show you some ways that you might do it if you're a commercial producer um, as well. So then eventually from my wine rack, I went to a bigger rack and I got grow lights. And then I started eating them more frequently because it was in the middle of the pandemic and I didn't want to go outside and buy things. So I had my, my radishes and my beets and those are just cacti. And then I ended up getting more um, of these trays and then eating, eating them for lunch and for with my omelets and things. So, you know, you could buy one of those racks you get at Home Depot that has a lot of shelves, industrial type. Uh, you can buy grow lights uh, and then you can buy trays. So one of the things that I like the most is a tray with no holes. And so you describe these growing trays by inches. So sometimes if you go to a nursery, they'll have the trays that are this big. So that's 20 inches by 10 inches. But I like this size 10 by 10 because they're easier to carry around, and I like the square more than a rectangle, and I can hold it with one hand. That's just a personal preference. But I don't like the holes because I will have grow lights underneath, and I don't want it to leak down. Now, you could have a separate thing underneath. So th this one could have holes, and you have one that's collecting the water. But um, considering this is only really growing for seven days, I don't want to worry about all the water and stuff. I just make sure the, water the soil always looks moist, and then we're good to go. Um, also, another thing is with racks, I always recommend they have wheels. Just uh, personal experience is that life becomes hellish when you have to move these uh, without wheels. So pay the extra 20 bucks and get wheels. Um, I have one of these in my office at work, and the wheels made it too tall, so I have to have someone. Anyway, the lights here, I, so if you ask plant people, they'll say, okay, well, you can get full spectrum lights, you can get red and blue lights, which look pink. Uh, I recommend the full spectrum just because uh, there are certain properties to full spectrum light that will help develop the flavor a little bit more. If you ask um, cannabis growers, they also prefer full light because it gives them the product that they want. And then for me personally, one of the things that I'm into is the kind of 
psychophysiology of plants, so how seeing green plants makes you feel better and relaxed. And when you got these red and blue lights, the whole room's glowing pink, and it looks like um, a little off, because then the plants look kind of blackish brown, and you're not getting that kind of thrill of seeing a nice bright red beet microgrid. Uh, but that's up to you. And then for potting media, I actually use miracle Grow, but we'll talk about that in a second. So there's your rack. And there's your grow lights. Uh, you could have over 400 plants per tray, 10 by 10 tray. Uh, so let's put them on the rack. And you could have 20 trays per rack. That's assuming that you only put one of these on the shelf. So this shelf is a pretty much the same size. Um, you could put it at 20, uh, 10 by 20 trays here. But that would, you know, you'd have high light intensity in the middle and then lesser on the outside. So that's why I just like the 10 by 10 and putting it in the middle. Um, so you could grow a ton of things. So you could buy one of these racks for like 800 bucks, or you could just build it yourself. This comes all put together, and you can adjust the heights of the lights by pulling on this, so that way you have optimal you know, light um, for the plants. So growing systems, the requirements of plants are you need to have a media for something for the plant to grow into. You need to have nutrients. Some people will say, you don't need nutrients to grow microgreens. Uh, in my growing of microgreens, when I didn't use nutrients, they didn't develop as well. The flavor wasn't as robust, and the size was significantly smaller. Uh, and then you need to have water and light. Easy. Kindergarten. So kindergar we do this activity with kindergartners, so it's fun to introduce topics of we need water. Um, so with media, there's a couple different options, and I'll just kind of cycle through some of them and show you some of the benefits and downsides to them. So potting mix. You could buy any potting mix that has a fine enough media so it doesn't have big chunks of bark in it. Uh, you could get cocoa coir, which is made of the husk of a coconut. It's pretty sustainable because we have a lot of coconut husks uh, in the world. Hemp mat, also sustainable from some hemp fibers. You could get biostrate, felt, bio felt, uh, which is uh, biodegradable. This is probably one of the more premier products. Or you could get rock wool, which is uh, not a great option because it's basically like asbestos. But historically, the um, horticultural industry used a lot of rock wool. So um, you might find this in an old closet at an old garden center, and uh, you don't really want to be using this that much. So biostrate felt is something that is designed for microgreens, and it's, it's quite good. It, it's a hydroponic system, so you'd have to add water, and I would say add nutrients to it. It's pH balanced, so it won't throw off, you know, be super acidic or anything. It's biodegradable and lightweight. But once you use it once, you cut your microgreens along the hypocotyl, you have to throw it away. So it can become expensive. Uh, but you buy a big roll of it for about 90 bucks, and it can get you uh, uh, probably like two racks full if you grow them fully. So 40 trays. Um, there's two thicknesses. Uh, they describe that by their kind of uh, grams per meter squared. Both are good. I have grown with this. And I found it that some seeds did not properly anchor into that substrate really well uh, because they're just sitting on a felt. And so I would lose about 15% of the seeds. Um, so when you have your reusability, you can reuse this one, technically, you can reuse that, uh, and coca coir. So you could reuse those. The other ones you have to throw out. Uh, when you look at messiness, well, the mats, the hemp mat and biostrate are the least messy. You cut it to shape and you put it in the tray, easy. So if you're doing it indoors, that's a benefit. Um, biodegradable, well, the hemp mat is biodegradable, made of hemp fiber, and then biostrate felt, coca coir, and potting media are biodegradable. The other one is rock, it's basically spun um, rock. So rock is as biodegradable as sand. And then you have the need for adding nutrients, which is a whole nother layer. So you would have to add nutrients to all of these, except for your potting mix, which already has been optimized with compost and a nutrient mix. So the thing is you need to then find nutrients to add if you choose. So the way you would do it is you'd have to get a hydroponic nutrient mix. So you couldn't buy something you're supposed to put in your soil because there's different forms of nitrogen. And if you take a, a 
nutrient mix designed for your garden beds and you put it into the garden bed, you're going to have microorganisms breaking down that um, nitrogen into a form the plant can use. But when you buy one that's for uh, hydroponics, or yeah, they will be hydroponics, um, then it's already a form of, of uh, soluble nitrogen that's usable by the plant. So there's a couple different recommendations, but uh, at the end of the day, the most important thing is your nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus called NPK, which you'll see on you know, all of the uh, different bags in their ratios. Uh, if you're growing plants more long-term, then you need to have calcium and magnesium and sulfur. Those are the three other most important nutrients. So you have to add these different salts of calcium nitrate and magnesium, magnesium sulfate to get those. But for microgreens, I don't recommend it. I would just do NPK. Uh, water, it, pretty easy. You want a pH of like 5.5 to 6.5. Austin's water can li be a little bit alkaline. Uh, when I was in Hawaii, we had coral sand, which is equivalent to like limestone basically and it made the water alkaline. So we would have issues with some of our growth and development because when you have different, so the pH dictates what nutrients a plant can bring up from the uh, soil. Um, but our tap water is fine, especially when you're only growing it for seven days. Uh, there's different ways you can water them. If you grow them in this, you basically just fill it with water until you see everything is moist. Or you could grow them in what we call hydroponic. And so you could water them from the top and have them cycle through, have them wick up, or kind of sit the whole plant into a bed. So if you end up looking at microgreen different methods, there's different ways that you might see people growing them with having a tray and another tray and then flooding it and then unflooding it, coming having a wave action. That's a lot of work and minimizing that is my preference. A uh, light. So this is my favorite because light is fun and colorful. Uh, there's lots of different frequencies of light and different colors, but only certain colors are needed by the plant. So as you might know, um, this graph here shows us the amount of each color of light that is absorbed by the plant and how much is used. The plant absorbs a lot of blue light and a lot of red light. It reflects a lot of green and yellow. So that's why we see it that color. Um, so some people are like, okay, I'm going to optimize my system and save energy and just use blue and red lights. And then you get something that looks like this, uh, which is fine. This is perfectly viable. To me, it's a personal preference. I don't like it. So. Um, if you look at that light under a diffraction grating where you split up that light to see what colors are in it, like the Pink Floyd album with the little prism, you see what's in there? Um, you will get from that pink light these two lights. So it looks pink to us, but you know, it's blue and red. So trying to optimize. Blue and red light are what signal all of those different plant responses to grow uh, and, and uh, develop. So you could have these different types of light on your plants. Uh, I like these little grow lights that fit the racks perfectly. So your rack will probably be this width, and the grow lights are usually the same width, like two feet. Um, well, yeah, and they, they fit perfectly well across. So for me, I end up having, this is my rack, well, this is my rack, and then this is my tray, and I'll get two of them here. That way, I have maximum light. Not the most efficient, but I like everything to be uniform. And then you just hang them with zip ties, or you can have the, use the things they give you. Um, one thing to note is that you have my, what happens is whenever I show a graph, most people are not excited. And I have like videos where I have analytics of me talking about this stuff. And then, you know, oh, 50% of people are watching, and then graph, five people watch. Um, so graph, inverse square law. So basically, every distance you are, you get exponentially less light. Uh, and that graph doesn't help a lot to explain this principle uh, in a useful way. This is much more useful. So this is the source of light, and this is our plant uh, tray. So imagine this is our tray. If we have the light at this distance r, we'll get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine little beams of light. Uh, but as you go two distances r, you get only two uh, to three beams of light per tray. As you go three distances are, you only get one. So it is exponentially decaying. And that's one of the things that we might not realize with plants. So if you put a plant by this, the window, uh, you will get exponentially less light as you move away from that window. Inverse square law, super fun and fresh. Uh, so intensity exponentially decays as distance linearly, linearly increases. 
lots of math jargon, but you know, you get, it's fun to talk about. Uh, this just shows you that this plant is getting exponentially less light than that one over there, even though it looks linearly distant, different. Um, and then so when you buy the seeds, how many seeds do you put in the tray? Because that's probably the most uh, important thing aside from the light and the water and the media and all that. So if you buy your seeds from Johnny Seeds or any seed company, they'll probably tell you how many seeds to put per tray uh, in a unit that's probably weight related because that's how horticulturalists would do it. Um, what I end up doing is uh, following these guidelines pretty closely trying it out and then modifying it in my own preference and experience. So what you'll see here is that this is a trial they did in 2017. Um, they have their different varieties and then they tell you, okay, now they're using a 10 by 20 tray. So imagine this was twice as big. That's what they're accounting for. So how many seeds do I need to sow per 10 by 20 tray? If I'm doing the beets, 23 grams per 10 by 20 tray. That's what they recommend. And then they say, um, average yield per tray in ounces, 7.5, and average days to maturity, 17. So about two weeks, that's one of the long-term growing ones. Um, and then daikon radish, my favorite, 22.5, matures uh, in eight days. So that's what we see there. So I always recommend following the guidelines and then changing it to what fits your needs if you're growing them for personal use um, or commercial production. Planting density, that's what that's called. So if you're trying to make money, then this is what you would look at. Uh, you would evaluate the cost per ounce. So per the beet seeds at $6.75 per ounce, your end product is 7.5 ounces of beet microgreens if you optimize it right, got the right lights and everything. Um, so your ratio is 7.5 of your yield to input in terms of um, plant material microgreen out versus seed in. So, you know, this on top, divide by that. So with microgreens, anything above seven is considered good. That way um, you are getting a significant volume. And then you can end up selling your microgreens per ounce as much as you feel is appropriate for the market. But at uh, two years ago in the middle of pandemic, $5 per one ounce of beet microgreens, it was very reasonable. And then if you look at the whole flat, of the 10 by 10, then you could get about $40. So every day that that tray was growing, you'd get $2.5. Eh, you know, but imagine you have 100 trays, then it's something. And so a good support system is, oddly enough, Facebook. Um, Facebook has really nice groups to join for microgreen support. So I have some screenshots here. Microgreen for beginners, growing and selling microgreens, and microgreen support group. Um, the people here are just interested in learning about plants and growing them for their own benefit. So they're, no one is usually horrible, and it's usually supportive. You can see someone has a question, so they posted it. Okay, this is four days, and they're growing broccoli. This looks more like a sprout. They probably didn't give it enough light. They probably had it um, over here, and they thought, oh, this is enough light for this plant. No. We know the inverse square law tells us it's not, not, not enough light. Uh, you could also get a, a light meter to determine the intensity and photons and foot candles, but uh, yeah. And then different people are asking different questions about what types of light they should be using. Uh, do sh this is their personal preference and their experience. Um, they, people voted, there's not a lot of people, but they've recommended, oh, just buy really strong shop lights. And for me, I, I agree with that, as opposed to the kind of optimal plant grow lights. And then the very last part is uh, getting started growing your own. So there's a few details that I'll hit on because I realize that they're usually questions we get about them. So microgreens, there's a huge variety of them as we talked about. You can select uh, any crop you'd like as long as it's not uh, a nightshade. So nothing in the family Solanaceae. And this diagram was made by Johnny Seeds uh, and it's quite beautiful. It shows all the different types of radishes and the sorrel and the carrot and all the different herbs and options. And I would love this poster, so I just message them to try and get a poster. Um, so always read the back of your packets. Especially, so you could take any seed and grow it as a microgreen, but if you buy the ones that are marketed as microgreens, then they will be kind of selected for uniform germination at harvest time. If you bought carrot seeds and you grew them, you might note, and they're not microgreen label on the pack, 
Um, you might have some that are really different stages. The thing about the microgreen labeled ones is they'll have information for you to plant them, and then that, cult that type of you know, variety will be optimal. So that you can look at the broccoli here, and here in a couple of minutes you can come and taste them. Uh, you will notice that most of them here are the same size, so I could get my scissors and clip, 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 and they'd all be ready to go. If you had regular non-microgreen broccoli, they might not be as uniform. Um, dill. So I just included this because imagine a microgreen dill with such, oh, and those are beets, uh, with the same intensity. So you could use them in dips the same way you use regular dill, but the flavor will be much more sharp and uh, fresh. And you can grow it in your kitchen and then cut it. So that's really fascinating. And it ends up better, in my opinion. And then you could get your salmon. And then so I made borscht once, and I tried to get rid of my beets uh, in that. So there's lots of options. Uh, what is this referring to? Planting density. Oh, yes. So my recommendation is always to uh, follow the rules, but then change it once you realize what you want. There's a lot of variation within your plant growing. And you'll notice that it could be related to the size of the crop. Um, so these are both quick growing plants, but you'll notice that the radishes are much larger and the overall size is significantly different from the broccoli. You would harvest them still at the same size, uh, same time, but uh, this is just something to account for if you end up growing. Uh, obviously, if I were growing for production, I, this would all be broccoli and then another one that's all radish. Um, seed viability is another thing that is kind of often overlooked and we'll talk about them in a second. And then the weight of the seeds is also a reason why you might have different planting density on the charts and recommendations. So cilantro seeds are so light. Radish seeds are really heavy compared to cilantro. So one thing that after teaching like workshops of this class that people have realized uh, is they bought seeds and they've let them sit out in humid, hot climates like Austin or Hawaii. And then the seed dies, the little plant dies. So this is called seed germination viability or uh, seed viability. So this follows a curve that is very similar to lots of different systems, but you have like 95% of the seeds will be alive when they come out. And then there's a specific period of time where they're um, mostly fine. And there's a point where they rapidly decline. So rapid mortality of the little embryos. And that's called, the, so your germination percentage is on this axis. So at a certain point of time, germination percentage is gonna go down drastically. The way that you preserve seeds, most seeds that we would be using for microgreens is you want to store them at like 40% relative humidity. And um, this is F. This is supposed to be uh, the temperature is yeah, 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So you need them to be cold and dry. That's how you preserve seeds. So if you've if you heard of the seed bank in Svalbard, um, that's why that is in Norway. Put all the seeds in a cold, dry place. They'll last longer. There's some seeds you can't do that with, like mangoes and avocados, but microgreens, yes. So um, just to tie up some loose ends, if you had inquiries about this, the seed longevity is related to different stresses because it's alive, but it's just trying to, trying to chill until it is ready to grow. So it'll hit a point where there's a lot of uh, anti uh, abiotic stresses, and then you might even have pathogens infiltrating. So the plant has a lot of uh, oxidative stress. So basically, um, it's producing antioxidants to try and survive as a seed. And then once it gets uh, water and imbibed, then it is then saying, okay, our DNA is damaged. Let's fix the DNA and let's try and grow the root and uh, reproduce. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the most important thing is that you just try it and you just learn from your experience. So this is me trying to grow cilantro, and that is what I found to be the best planting density because of the size. And if you plant them too tightly, they'll end up being smaller uh, because they're competing with each other for nutrients. But nothing is that deep at the end. It's just plants. So uh, some last comments is that when you have this tray, you'll notice that the first day you add water, it'll still be wet the second day. But as they grow, the plants will be pulling up water. So the rate of water loss is related to the leaf surface area. So that's called transpiration. So you'll have uh, increasing leaf surface area that leads to increasing transpiration. So you got to put more water. Great. 
and then I use a sprayer. I didn't bring it today, but it's a little horticultural sprayer. You pump it, it sounds like a little duck, and then you squeeze it, and it mists it. So as the seeds are coming up, they're pushing through that media because they're so densely planted, you'll have the soil rising up together. And say, like, okay, what do I do now? So I spray it down with this mist, and it helps the particles of the soil go back down to cover those roots. And yes, so I always like to have a little thing at the end like this. So, so as... Uh, so we might think that we have failed if our plant dies, but better to have grown it and failed than to have never tried. So we ought to do our best to prevent things from going wrong, but we must understand that we're learners lifelong. So grow some microgreens. If they die, you learn something, and you can always give it a go again. They're just plants. But I love plants, so that's not a, you know, a jab at plants, but you know, always go for making mistakes, and uh, we'll, we'll learn something as we go. So, Thank you for being here and listening to me talk about microgreens. If you have questions, I'll help answer them. Uh, you can come and take these too. So you can just clip them on the, the hypocotyl um, and taste them. So we have three different types here. We have the, the daikon radish, which is pure green, kind of spicy. There's the red rambo radish and then broccoli. The broccoli tastes like broccoli. The schnozberries taste like schnozberries, you know. So anyway, if you've got questions, I'll be here. If not, thank you. Appreciate y'all. Fun. Okay.